we're going to get this show on the road. Okay. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Everybody in the back, you can hear me all right? Sure. It's fine? Okay. So we're using mild amplification this evening, okay? So the microphones always help a little bit, takes the strain off the voice, right? All right, so welcome. Welcome to the Wyoming Dinosaur Center, and thank you for coming and showing your interest and support in this new project, and the new exhibit, uh, exciting new dinosaur found here in Wyoming. Where we're going to work it tonight is that uh, I'm going to introduce a few people that are up in the front here so that you know who they are. My name is Jack Turnbull. I'm on the science staff here at the WDC, and I get to act as the moderator. Now, after the introductions, we will go right into questions and answers. There will be no speeches tonight. You get a chance to just start asking your questions right away of the three people that are to my right, three members of the research team, that studied Lori and have just recently participated in publishing the scientific uh, paper, the complete scientific paper on Lori, its description, its history, and its implications for paleontology. So, I will begin by uh, introducing the people to my left. Uh, immediately to my left is uh, Bob Crisco, He's the president and on the board of directors of the Wyoming Dinosaur Center. To his left is our executive director, Angie Guyon, who I affectionately call Boss Lady. <laughs> to her left is Howard Meisler. He's come in from Douglas. Okay? And it's the Meisler family that's responsible not only for the fact that we have the Lori specimen, but because we also have the bones from Jimbo the Supersaurus that you see here in the museum. Howard's left is Angela Reddick. She's on the science staff there as well and is also our dig sites manager. Okay. And to her left is Andrew Rossi on the science staff here. And Andrew also participates in public relations and public outreach here for the center. So on my right, we have three members of the uh, research team, as I said earlier. To my immediate right is Bill Wall. He's our lead paleontologist and also the manager of the preparation lab here. Uh, next to him is Dr. Dean Lomax, who's come in from the UK, all the way from Manchester. He is on the faculty at the University of Manchester in Manchester, England. And to his right is Jessica Lippincott, who is on the science staff here as well, and uh, serves as our education program director. Okay? Very busy job. There are three other members of the research team that are not here tonight. Scott Harmon, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and he's the lead author on the paper and is the communicating author for the paper. For those of you that are in the press, you have a media kit. If you didn't get one in the back corner there, all the contact information you need is there for you to contact anybody on this research team, okay, including also members of the staff here at WPC. Uh, there's also Mickey Mortimer, who is a specialist in studying the classification of dinosaurs and using the software to do that. And also uh, Dr. David Lovelace, who is also at the uh, University of Wisconsin in Madison, a uh, geologist. Uh, all three of those were not able to be here tonight. And over in the corner on the far right is Levi Schenkel. He is our collections manager and a very good photographer, so he gets all the video and photographic duties around here, taking pictures of all our specimens as part of the cataloging effort. Okay, so those are the people that are here to serve you tonight answer your questions. Right. Okay, so we will get started with that right now. Andrew is going to have a, a wireless microphone here. He's going to circulate around. Anybody has a question, just raise your hand. 
two or three people at a time is fine. He will sort it all out and get the microphone to you so you can ask a question of the panel. You can ask a question individually to anybody on the panel. We're on a first name basis tonight as well, okay? All right, just first names for everybody. And, or you can throw it to the panel as a whole and they'll sort it out and try to give you reasonably intelligent answers. Hi. <coughs> Excuse me. Hi, my name is Ernie Over with wildtoday.com and Conversion. Um, after receiving the news release, the first question that popped into my mind was non-scientific. Where did Lori come from? What's that name signify? Lori, Lori was named for, this is, yeah, you're on. Yeah. Lori was named for uh, Lori Hockemeyer, who's a volunteer uh, collecting at the dinosaur site for Jim Bowes Local Collection Trip. We named it after her because uh, Lori was a small, intense person in the dinosaur world, basically small, and she worked on the club. Now I know. Yeah. <laughs> First, a simple follow-up question. I'm Tom Morton with K2 Radio and Casper, but also just here because this is cool. Uh, <laughs> is Lori the dinosaur a boy dinosaur or a girl dinosaur? With the, the nicknames we give the dinosaurs are usually based in respect to a, a person that we can name things after in honor of someone, not a scientific name, yeah. uh, but in, in honor of a person. So there's no, we, we don't have, uh, it's not for, for a girl or a boy dinosaur. Oh, okay, so we, you don't know which gender that? We don't We don't nice. know enough about the gender of dinosaurs in general. I mean, there's suppositions and there's ideas of how to identify them, but it's not It's not a, a, a clear cut science yet. And just go over how Lori was found and then sort of the, gee, what is this thing here? And how did it come to be here? Lori was found uh, accidentally because we were digging through a formation above Jimbo. So Jimbo is our 106 foot long supersaurus specimen that's over a stretch of the entire museum. In digging through the layer above Jimbo, uh, we encountered a bunch of small pieces of bone and they stuck out, they stuck out like a sore thumb because the barium, which is a bright pink mineral that is on the inside of the bones, uh, was not, it was not your typical brown background dirt layer. So it kind of stuck out. The bones of Lori are paper thin, pretty much like a soda straw or a, a pen cap. And because they were hollow, they were, they were filled in with barite, which is barium and sulfur as a mineral. And that stuff turns pink. And when you see it exposed, it kind of draws your eye to it, so we're able to identify something. Uh, but to answer the question, Lori was not expected in this formation. And that's why we had to stop, slow down, and uh, collect all the little pieces of it. In fact, we actually went through the talus pile, which is bits and pieces of rock and dirt that are mixed in that are pulled out to make sure we had everything for it. And even then we only came up with about 60% of the skeleton. So there was damage done to the specimen. So that teaches you a lesson about going through the stuff slowly. Yeah, Jim, can you explain the significance of Lori's discovery in such close proximity to Jimbo the Supersaurus? It's, it's, it's the biggest dinosaur in Wyoming and the smallest dinosaur in Wyoming. And to find something of, of such detail next to something so large is really interesting. It fleshes out a paleo environment. Uh, instead of people picture the, uh, the forest information as just large lumbering uh, sauropods moving in herds, well, there were little things around them as well. Right? So it fleshes out the rest of the paleo environment. You have small animals darting in and out of the bushes around active uh, stream or moving uh, bodies of water along with the large dinosaurs as well. Uh, the significance of that is something very large and something very small come together in the same place. And the detail we're finding on the, the large bones as well as the small animals is just incredible. I mean, we're learning more about the association of these small dinosaurs to uh, dinosaurs that came after them. So Lori really fills in that gap between an Archaeopteryx, which was found earlier than uh, the Lori specimen, to what's Lori and then the material that's found say it's the fills in a gap. Um, had you or has paleontology in general 
found such a combination of the small little dinosaur next to the pretty huge one before? Or is this unique? Mm, yeah, it's a good question. So, um, off the top of my head, I can't think of any of the small dinosaurs found at the side of the really big ones like this. But I think in terms of what Bill's saying, in filling a gap, that's, that's with respect to where the animal fits in in the big family tree of dinosaurs. So, working that out, Lori is a little sort of velociraptor-like dinosaur. It belongs to a group of dinosaurs called Truodontids, and they're very close related to Velociraptor and Co. But what we know about this animal, because of where it fits on this big family tree of, of dinosaurs, is other dinosaurs that are being found in places like in China, you have specimens there that are, are preserved with so much exceptional preservation that they have feathers. And they're so closely related to Lori that without a doubt, Lori also would have had feathers. So that's the major sort of discovery with this specimen because it indicates some interesting insights into the evolution of birds and the evolution of, of flight generally in, 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 in avians. And, and with that, thinking about that in mind, it, it suggests that perhaps the evolution of flight would have been from, um, developed in ground-dwelling dinosaurs. So it wasn't a case that dinosaurs were running off trees and jumping out of them. Yeah, so, sorry, that, that dinosaur wouldn't have been at the top of the tree you know, jumping out and flying. It would have essentially feathers and, and that would have come first. So it wouldn't all have been about, about feathers for flight. Instead, the feathers would have been used for a bunch of things from sexual display, perhaps, or to, you know, to show that it was scary, to, to ward off predators, or potentially to um, even help with, with keeping eggs warm, you know, brooding eggs. And, yeah. Uh, my question is addressed to Dean. Yeah. Uh, you just talked uh, about the claws relationship to the Velociraptor. Okay. Yeah. So have you es established the, the cladistic analysis of uh, of that uh, uh, AFC? What is the name? I didn't remember. Esperanto, yes. Yeah. Have you? Thank you. Okay, so, so yeah, that, that sort of echoes what I just talked about a little bit. So when we look at the, the family tree of how these animals fit together, it's a fancy word called phylogeny. And so working that out, to be fair to the three of us, the two people who primarily worked on that are Scott Hartman and Mickey Mortimer. But our findings as a, as a team suggest that in reality, as I just mentioned, is that uh, Laurie fills in that gap in, in terms of mm -hmm. aiding with the discovery that, you know, that there's two sort of arguments, there's two but groups of scientists. One group think that birds evolved by basically going up the trees, uh, the dinosaurs growing up the trees, jumping out of the trees, or they evolved from sort of ground, ground up, which is what the discovery of Laurie indicates, that you had these animals that were already feathered, and therefore eventually, you know, that, that suggests that flight in, in dinosaurs, in particular for, for birds, evolved multiple times. So could you tell us a little bit about what Lori would have, what kind of uh, the other animals that, that she or he ate, you know, and stuff like that, and what would be the, the, the length of its life, or do we know that, or are we talking about, you know, a couple years, do they live very long, or do we, we probably don't even know that. So. Yep. yep, okay, so in terms of what it would have eaten, so we're painting a picture of this little thing, you, you can all imagine, right, you've seen chickens, right? So, so imagine it's a chicken with a long tail and with a, with a, with a sharp snout full of teeth. That's what you're, you're thinking about. That's what Hesperonychoides would have looked like. And it wasn't particularly big. You know, we think it was about roughly 89 centimeters. And possibly also about a, a meter, maybe max. But as part of our work, we interpreting the bones, we suspect that Lori was also either a subadult or an adult, so you know, a fully fledged adult. Now, in terms of what it would have been feeding on, most likely would have been feeding on anything small, like small lizards, small mammals, insects, possibly even small dinosaurs too. You know, there were other small dinosaurs <coughs> found in this particular formation where Lori's from, um, including a thing called Fruitidens that was found in Colorado. So that's a very small, similarly sized dinosaur. So you can imagine that 
that's probably probably equivalent of preyed upon dinosaur by that too. And then in terms of working out how old the thing could have could have been, we're, we're not sure. We didn't look at anything to work that out. But in comparison, there are studies done on dinosaurs trying to work out how, how old things may, may or may not be. And you know, for example, some of the T-Rex skeletons that have been found, they've been studied and assessed in that capacity. You know, several of these have been suggested to have lived up to potentially to about 50 years old or something. So, you know, it's, it's possible maybe. Again, anything I suggest would be hypothetical, of course, but you know, in reality, it's easy. Could be well. when you consider the closest living relatives now within the groups of birds uh, that have expanded age ranges. If, for instance, like uh, African gray parrots, if you buy an African gray parrot as a pet, you just bought a pet for your kids that you're going to have to take care of as well. Uh, if you look at crocodiles and uh, archosaurs, some of these animals are 100 years old. So if you look at something like Jimbo, you have an animal that may have gotten to 75 to 100. Now, in the case of Oregon, it was, it was a sub-adult, but not a baby of another dinosaur. And that was one of the first questions in studying people were going to ask. This is, oh, you think this is something new? Prove that it's not a juvenile of a known specimen. So you have to compare it to all other known specimens in that general area, in that general environment. Then you start looking for the associations with that animal as compared to other things like in China, Europe, other parts of the world, from the same time period as well as older and uh, more recent animals. So if you're asking about the <coughs> There were very few gaps between any of the vertebrae that said that this was still growing. Now, it might have gotten a little bit larger. And when it's going, when, in the case of Lori being the smallest dinosaur for Wyoming, if it's going after other dinosaurs, it's probably going after chicks or hatchlings or smaller dinosaurs as well, possibly even of its own kind. There's no reason why it wouldn't be capitalistic as well. A uh, follow up question for Dr. Lomax. Um, you mentioned that the um, Feathered dinosaurs in China are very, very well preserved. Mm -hmm. And this dinosaur was also feathered, Lori was feathered. Is there any significance to finding a feathered dinosaur here as well as in China because of the great distance? In reality, apart from it just being a, a super cool find, the answer would be no, because we already have members of the same family, this Prudentin family from China that have feathers so it wouldn't be surprising to find it. I think more so it has to come down to a preservational aspect. So you know, the preservation of dinosaurs here in, in, in Wyoming in the Morrison Formation, you know, generally it's very rare to have say skin preserved. You know, there, there are specimens known to have you know, skin preserved, they're, they're incredibly rare, but in reality it would just be a case of if we had a specimen of feathers, it would just be really cool and exciting. But it wouldn't really add anything in terms of the big picture because we already know yeah the specimens from China have the The, the outer sheath of one of the claws may have been preserved from the Lori specimen. And we're really excited because Dave Lovelace had identified that in the birth of Crepley specimen. So the potential of a keratin sheath on a claw being preserved in this without the uh, without having the opportunity of finding feathers along associated with the animal as well is really exciting as well. But the geochemistry of the, of the deposit is very limiting when it comes to preservation of something like this. A lot of the plant material that you think would be perfectly so there's a lot of carcass material that's going to be moved around. That this was 60%, you know, uh, identified or preserved in the position that it's in, uh, with articulated vertebrae for the neck, for portions of the back, for portions of the tail, although disjointed and broken up, and that one of the claws, the, the uh, arms was really tucked under and around the head. Uh, this animal didn't travel far from where it did die, so the, the deposition was pretty good considering this is the Morris information that normally fast moving. Knocking carcasses all over. And to add to that as well, something which is interesting, and it's a little bit debatable because of how the specimen was, how, how it's preserved. It's not fully articulated, we don't have the full skeleton, and we don't have the feathers and, and that soft part preservation. But the way in which it's preserved, there is some indication that perhaps it could be like a couple of other truodontids that are known from China that have been found in what's been referred to as either a sleeping position or a resting position where perhaps. This, these are the dinosaurs, one of them is called, it's called Me, and where Me perhaps you know, went to sleep and then sadly it, it died, it was covered over by, by a mudslide or something like that. Potentially, that could have happened with Hesperonothodias as well, because of that, that articulation was preserved and because it seems that it's got its, as Bill just mentioned, that the, the, it seems that the, 
the arms sort of tucked underneath and the tail's wrapped around. So there's, there's a possibility that I could also have adapt, adopted that, that, kind of, that resting pose and potentially maybe that was typical of, of that group of, of dinosaurs. And that, that gets, oh, sorry. No, I just said okay. And that gets into the aspects of ethology or, or uh, behavior. And as interesting and as interesting as behavior is with groups of animals that are around today, so we use what we call phylogenetic bracketing, you know, saying that if the birds did this, it's most likely that the dinosaurs did this. So if you're, if you're trying to fit an animal into something like that, you can identify the position. Unfortunately, a lot of that then becomes anthropomorphized. You find three dinosaurs together sooner or later, somebody says, mommy, daddy, and baby. But no, the river could just stuck a bunch of animals together at one point. You just you know, match up all the bones together. Mm -hmm. So there's all, people want to start anthropomorphizing this as to the animal was sleeping, they were struck by a lightning bolt, they were hit by a car, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, gets, it, gets into a, it gets into a good discussion, but again, we're going to stick with uh, what we actually have to work with in the rock. Where it comes from. <laughs> Were there any specific anatomical features that uh, sort of a lot of people place it in this family? There's portions, portions of the back of the skull were nematicized, especially in the quad, especially in the quad grade. Uh, the most important one that for us was there was a slight constriction between the tooth and the root. Uh, that, that has been looked at in other teeth, and it's only featured in one or two teeth, so that might be something that we look at closely with better uh, identification or magnification or scanning. There's a nutrient groove that runs along the outside edge of the, uh, of the jaw, and that's a feature for periodontics as well. The back of the skull is relatively large compared to the rest of the body. Uh, there's uh, something in the back of the skull. Yeah, there's something else in the back of the and other parts in the skull. The, the interesting thing with it is when, when actually Bill originally worked on the specimen as part of his master's back in 2006, right? Yeah, in 2006. And so when Bill first tried to work out where Hesperonychoides fit into the, 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 the big dinosaur tree, it came out then as a, as a true odontid. So that was really exciting, really, really interesting. But then when we started with this recent work a couple of years ago, again, uh, by, by using updated versions of this, this as I mentioned before, called phylogeny, this, this big analysis of the family tree, it still came out as a true odontid. But after a revision by some of the scientists looking at our work and reviewing the work, it, one of our analyses it came out as a, as a dromaeosaur, so as literally the same group that Velociraptor belongs to. So we were quite surprised by that. And then we, we added a few more characters for our analysis, and we added a few more different dinosaurs, and then it turned out as a true odontid again. So that's intriguing. And what that suggests is that potentially, or in, in theory, what is likely to happen with more discoveries and additional research you know, over the coming years, potentially Hesperonychoides position may change. You know, it may turn out to be a dromaeosaurid, but this is what happens, and that's science, of course. You know, our understanding, our interpretation at the moment is that it is a, a member of the true odontidae, and it's, you know, it's a true odontid, but it could well turn out to be a, a dromaeosaur or something very closely related. And you know, as part of our work, our analysis is, is showing that you know, we're not sort of arm waving saying this is the best, you know, best analysis ever. We're basically applying this as a, as a foundation for others to come along and add to and, and work with it as well. I have a question for Jess. Um, so, just as education director here, um, how do you see uh, Lori's role as a teaching tool uh, within the context of the WDC, especially in a world where, like, cinematic value is ascribed and cache are ascribed to dinosaurs based on like size and. <laughs> Cool things that a lot of children and 
do so, I'll be able to take away with it is that the closest relative to that is outside. You know, I walk outside, you're going to see these birds flying around. You know, it's not something that died 150 million years ago, or you know, later than that, 100 million years ago. The closest relative to that thing that's you know outside still alive. So that's always a cool thing. Yeah. I think for kids to take away, it's kind of mind blowing. Is it believed that Lori's sclerotic ring would have had uh, a similar purpose to uh, the rings that we find in other dinosaurs, such as Alluramus? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I suspect so. Yeah, most likely. Um, perhaps it played a, a similar similar role to saying the the birds as well, maybe. Because you hold the position of the pupil in a fixed position, mm -hmm. especially now in the case of living, living uh, dinosaurs, in the case of birds, when a falcon is diving, in, going into a dive, the eye will adjust constantly to keep an eye on where the target is, whether it's a mouse grab another bird in the air or something like that. So it's keeping a fixed position and a fixed size because the pupil is going to want to change. You can become an oblong. Some of the other animals we work on here at the Dinosaur Center, uh, ichthyosaurs have more sclerotic ring too, mm -hmm. for some of the same reasons. Only in that case, it's hydrostatic shock from the depth of the water. So you want to keep that same position there. The, the, the idea that we actually had evidence of sclerotic ring found with them more is really, really good uh, uh, CT scanning as well as prepping to be able to identify and, hide and uh, preserve some of that stuff. So keep an eye on small stuff. I keep an eye out for small stuff. Is good yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that as well. It kind of goes back to what we said a little bit earlier with respect to you know, Lori being found in the same formation as the, as the big dino celebrities like Stegosaurus, Diplodocus, and Allosaurus. And you know, you think about it, you can turn around and take a look at Jimbo there. Look at the size of some of those vertebrae. You know, this, the neck vertebrae there was three times as big as Lori. And so when you're working in stuff in the Morrison, you, you always have it, a preconceived idea in your mind that you're expecting to find big stuff, right? So to find something like Lori is so delicately preserved is a remarkable thing. It's such a, an incredible fossil. One of the nice things about the, the positioning of the display case that shows off the Lori Block specimen as well as the, the, the mouth is that standing right there in front of that case, you can literally back away to see the Archaeopteryx, the Velociraptor, uh, more uh, more delicate specimens like a pterosaur to the far left. Pterosaurs not being dinosaurs, but Lori was identified as a potential pterosaur for almost eight months before we actually got around to prepping out parts of the skull so you can see the teeth. Pterosaurs don't have cerebral fatigue, so that kind of changed that whole game when we first found it. But the delicacy of the individual bones, again, it's really soda straws filled with minerals. So when you're prepping something like that and you, you notice how thin it is, my first thought was we have a pterosaur because nothing else found in that formation was this thin and delicate. So you're automatically producing biases when you're prepping something. What could it possibly be? What could it possibly be? It must be a pterosaur. Then you find out it's a therapy, so you literally have the opportunity. That this is something new and cool just by the identification of two or three factors in that. Now, is it a juvenile of a known specimen? Okay, you've gotten rid of that idea. Now it's becoming more and more unique and more <laughs> oxymoron again, something more and more unique. Never mind. <laughs> uh, you, it's becoming more interesting because it's something that's that you know is always supposed to be there. You have Archaeopteryx and a gap, and then you have something so still in that gap that should have been there. To find it in a position where it's literally 10 centimeters above the largest dinosaur in Wyoming, you know, that's incredible. And one of the largest dinosaurs in the world. Yes, yeah, just one of the largest Wyoming. I'm going to jump. Oh. Going to jump in here pretty quickly. We got a question via Facebook. In terms of biogeography, are there any solid guesses as to where Lori's family, the Troodontids, originated? Zoom, it would probably indicate that it's, it's got to be in, in China, right? If 
that's the ultimate material, but we'll wait and see what happens with any new discovery. So older true adoption material in China would also make sense because there is evidence of an interchange in the formation of marine animals in the sun dance beneath the moors. So if you have an interchange of something like that with a, a seaway moving animals back and forth, you could potentially have a, a land bridge or an associated bridge for, for animals moving back and forth from Europe, Asia, back to North America as well at that same time period. So you have to go back and use uh, maps that have been developed by structural geologists for those specific time periods. I guess one of, the, one of the other interesting things about this is Lori is a specimen of one. We have to keep mentioning that it's a specimen of one. If this should be an impetus to get more people out there to look for more in their collections, that there's been more material identified. So the, the paleogeography is a good question from the person who uh, sent that via text. There's, we need more people digging through their collections to find bits of teeth now that they've identified as paper, published paper. We need people looking more in anthills where they find some material for our dinosaurs. Because if it's something this small and this you know, this uh, unique for this in the environment, but only one and this complete, that means there's most of the more of them out there. So find that trail. Find the trail from Chinese material all the way back to Europe, beginning in the Jurassic. Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll add to that as well. I think I'm pretty confident that somewhere there is some other element of what is Hesperonothoides in, in a collection, almost certainly. Perhaps this identified as yeah, a pterosaur. Exactly, that's what I was going to, to suggest, is that perhaps they're misidentified as a pterosaur, you know, just fragments of bone, because some of the stuff, as you can see, after, after you take a look at the, the skeleton, is just so delicate, the bones there. So, you know, to identify some of that stuff, you can imagine out in the field, sometimes if you find some of that, it's really fragmentary, you might think, oh, it's just a, a tiny bit of bone, you know, we've got hundreds of these giant bones you need to collect of Jimbo or, or the the large sauropods or whatever. So I, I strongly suspect there is something else out there in a, in a museum collection that is most likely has grown authorities, but it'll take some time to, to work it out. But you know, as Bill said, the study's out there now, so people can go back through the older collections and, and hopefully rediscover something quite, quite amazing. still at that big site on this gentleman's ranch looking for other specimens? Yes, we were, we were visiting it today. Okay. So we've been working the site since 1994. Okay, so it's still... It's still producing. Still producing. Oh, yes. Okay, great. So maybe you can find another one. I certainly hope so. But that, that means we have to go slowly through the formation above Jimbo, so it's going to take longer to find more material of Jimbo, which is not complete. We're still finding parts of the largest dinosaur in Wyoming. So it's, it's, it's getting, it's having to, you can't sieve it, but you have to go slowly through and block through the material. And because it's producing a small animal like this, we hope that it'll also produce more to flesh out that paleo environment. Maybe even just more plant material would be worth it. Uh, we have evidence of crocodile or turtle material from the same site, so we want to flesh out that as well. But that just means more people looking in that layer and then getting back to the Jimbo layer underneath and then getting the Jimbo layer out of the way so I can work on marine reptiles that are at the same site. So it's a layer cave. And we did find uh, evidence of another uh, specimen uh, in the Jimbo layer last year as well, possibly a Camarasaurus. Uh, what percentage of the total bones have been found? And how did you uh, fill in the blanks? Uh, you didn't find 100% of the skeleton yet. No, no. So, about so how did you, what percent has been found of the total skeleton, and how did you fill in the empty spaces? So there was about 60% of the skeleton that was found, and then we look for the, the skeleton that's on display for those missing pieces. What we did was we had it 3D scanned, and then it was reconstructed from the existing bones uh, to, to fill in those missing pieces. Those people right there yeah. did it. Yeah. So. <laughs> Stand and acknowledge yourselves. Yes. So, from Idaho for Trust Nation Lab. Yeah. Anything wrong with it? Hello. Hello. <laughs> Jesse Pruitt, I managed the 3D lab that did the 3D scanning and modeling of this. And this is Evelyn Bolmer. She's a college student. She's one of my CPI students there at the university. And this was her first time making a reconstruction of an animal. So, yeah. We can, we can address that if you would. 
Yes, absolutely. You didn't know. And so we were fortunate enough to be asked to do this. Andrew contacted me in um, production here. Yeah, so this is the skeleton we were able to reproduce. And Andrew drove the specimen over to us there in Idaho, in Pocatello. If you've ever been through there, we have a little museum there. Uh, so our stick is 3D scanning and 3D modeling, 3D printing. So we were able to use 3D technology basically to, to scan the, the specimen. We use laser scanning technology, a combination of that photogrammetry. And then they had done a CT scanning of the specimen as well. So using those three techniques, we extracted the bones. And then over a period of what that, four, four or five months, I guess, we were um, extracting that material digitally. So as, as much of the real material is in here as possible. So if you look at the specimen that's on display, you'll be able to see, um, we made a distinction between the real bone and the fake bone. So if you look at the specimen, anywhere that's got a rough texture, that's real bone that we pulled out of the rock and put into the specimen. Anywhere that's smooth is where we, we fabricated the bone. And we wanted to make that a clear distinction on what was real and what wasn't. And then working with the research team, we went back and forth on um, specimens that were related to it and using that as reference for filling in the pieces that they didn't have. So as Dean mentioned earlier, they were going back and forth on is it a true odontid, is it a Manny Raptorian, what is it related to? So we would, they would go, oh, it's a Manny Raptorian, so we'd start digitizing and filling in the piece, and they're like, oh, now it's a true odontid, so we'd have to switch to a different specimen. That's sort of thing going on. But that's, that's the story of it, about 60% real, and then um, the rest of it's fabricated digitally based on other specimens we're able to find reference material. And that, that 60 percent of the when you get a chance to take a look at the display uh, material on the other side, but the display case for Lori, the, the the block contains at 60 percent of the skeleton contains parts of every single part of the animal. You have representative vertebrae from all parts of the tail. You have representative parts of the dorsal vertebrae and the cervical vertebrae. So from there, you know, we may have A and B. We're certainly be able to surmise that B and C fills in the rest of it. Yeah, I'll just add as well to that is, is this process of sort of using 3D scanning has really revolutionized paleontology. It's, it's really opened it up to the world. I, I've also done a little bit of 3D scanning from my research projects too. And one of the best things about it is once you have that data there, it's available to pretty much any researcher around the world. You, know, you can send that data to somebody in South America, somebody in Britain, me, you can send it to anybody. And they can look at that data as well. So it makes these things much more accessible to, to scientists, but also to, for education as, as well, because you know, potentially you could send that data to a, to a class elsewhere across, across America, and you know, they could use that data to print stuff out. You know, in theory, you could even print these things out too. So yeah, it's, it's really helped, helped revolutionize early on. We've got another question on Facebook. Do you expect to possibly find more dinosaur species in the same area as these two dinosaurs were discovered? Yes, so we, we have discovered another specimen there, and who knows how many more that we will find, because the hill is quite big, so there's still a lot of material that needs to be removed. And we don't know how far that bone layer goes into the hill as well, either. So it could stop in five feet, or it could go for another 50 feet, and there could be 10 more specimens. We really just, we really just don't know. So far, I think, what, what have we got? Obviously, you have Tesseronophoides, you have Jimbo, the Supersaurus, you have the probable Camarasaurus, then Allosaurus as well, Allosaurus, and... Yeah, the mystery Stegosaurus. Yeah, Stegosaurus as well, and another mystery sauropod. So it's a uh, yeah, really productive site. All, all of these are property of us. So with a formation like the Morrison, um, what does such a high density of fossils indicate about the paleo environment at the time? Um, I guess why would there be such a high density of fossils in that space? In some cases, in some cases it's going to be because the, the water deposition is going to pull a lot of material together. So you can have carcasses floating down from seasonal flooding that are going to be a mass together in one place. Uh, in other cases where you have fully articulated animals, it could die in one place and be buried at once. In the case of Jimbo, Jimbo was buried at least twice. It was part of what's called a single event debris flow, which is basically a, a soft levee, falls into a river system, and then is redeposited and redeposited again. So that's why we don't have, we think we do not have a complete skeleton of Jimbo, because something that big 
really a uh, limited amount of articulation, creating little pieces. But finding multiple things like Lori slightly above Jimbo, which makes it a different quarry because it's a different pillar environment with deposit. We're excited about the Lori layer because small things are being found articulated, meaning that the bone, head bone, connected to the neck bone, connected to the neck bone, is a lot easier than finding disarticulated material. So we have a super, we think we have a rich layer of material that has potential. Then you have the Jimbo layer that we have to get around to getting the rest of that out as well. But finding Allosaur material less than 100 yards away in a totally different, even slightly below, separate facing within a small area just means you had a diverse uh, paleo environment at that time. Not all those paleo environments were occurring at the same time. So it could be 300 million, uh, 300,000 years between some of those groups, or it could be as easy as just yesterday, where you had a pond dry out and was reflooded through a system like that. So you, if you change paleo environments, you change the resources of a paleo environment. And each time, something else is going to take advantage of that resource, like a, adaptive radiation. You open up a uh, uh, an alluvial fan of a river, and within a thousand years, you may develop. A, a huge diversity of just bird species is that one resource that they can expand into. So if you keep changing a resource, something's going to take advantage of that. In the case of, well, of the, you know, the largest dinosaur or something like that, so it didn't get there by itself. There must have been a, a family group or uh, a herd moving through an area that produced something that big. So where are the rest of them? Well, there, there's evidence that there's more than one sort of in the state already. Hopefully the next one's better articulated, more complete. So we can finish our research. I guess I've got a question actually, well, to ask myself, <laughs> <laughs> to, ask, to ask you, Jess. Yeah, it's not to put you on the spot either. But no, I'm just thinking about in terms of education, in terms of uh, Laurie's discovery and the importance globally for the Wyoming Dinosaur Center as a museum. <laughs> That's that accent, isn't it? <laughs> okay, I'll keep it slow. So, in terms of the discovery of Laurie, and its importance for the Wyoming Dinosaur Center. You know, thinking about putting the museum on the map. What, what do you think about that? I think it's, uh, I think it's really good. Um, I think it's even more important for our state, I guess, um, just because the Wyoming Dinosaur Center is already known for for the Archaeopteryx, and uh, but I feel like we need to be known for something else as well. With Lori staying here in Wyoming, that's that's really important for, for the state of Wyoming. People from Wyoming are very proud of, of the state and, and this is part of our heritage. So to keep it here is probably the most important thing to me. Yeah, no, I, I would agree, especially considering yes, yeah, the only specimen known in the entire world. You know, and that's pretty epic to have that here at this museum. You know, it really places it. And that means the researchers have other, another researcher who disagrees with the phylogeny or the description that you had of this animal. They have to come here. We're not sending this thing somewhere else unless we're sending it to a place to get better CT information or uh, you know, where, where the technology can help improve the information. But if you don't physically see the specimen, you have to stay here. Come here. I'm mean, afraid that you have to stay here. You have to come here. Um, you know, you know, it, 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 it'll, be, it'll benefit. The research aspect of people visiting one new dinosaur center and uh, and the big six, you know, find another one, increase that end value, find more than one specimen. If you disagree with our description of what this animal is, prove it. Find something else. It's not a mean challenge. <laughs> we can say it nicely. Please come. Has there been any egg material found from other known troodontids like in China by any chance? And if so, could you use that egg material that's available to estimate how big the eggs of Hesperornithides might have been? We could probably estimate what the size range for the eggs for Hesperornithides already just based on the body shape and body size of them. But then you run into the kiwi factor to give a giant egg a small bird. But to answer the question about potential of egg shell material, the geochemistry of Morse information is really, again, it's doubtful where we're going to identify egg material in there, but there's always a possibility. Uh, 
there's a possibility of finding a keratin sheath on something as small and delicate as a cloth or the worry specimen, there's maybe a possibility of finding egg material buried within that as well. It would have to be within a nesting site, a closed bed nesting site, where that means that there's less transport or almost no transport, like if you have the, the dig sites, the, of the nesting sites for Myasaurus up in uh, uh, Montana. So to answer that question for this time period in this part of the world, it's possible but not probable, I'll put it that way. But the egg size range, I mean, we don't go by the living of the, the skeleton right now, just suppose that. So how big? Uh, honestly, paint ball ball. I would go with some yeah. small stuff. Like that. Mm -hmm. Um, back to people will have to come here. Uh, this sounds really tacky in context of everything else, but <clears throat> what is the economic <laughs> impact of people coming here and staying here and playing in hot springs and eating at the restaurants and that kind of stuff? Any idea? It's definitely needed. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, has there been any? I'm from Casper, can, you know, tourism and all that's a big deal, and I'm just kind of wondering. It adds to it, yes. Our, our town is uh, very focused on tourism, uh, and so we, we do rely on people that do come to Thermopolis. A lot of people do come to Thermopolis for the hot springs, but then a lot of people come here just for the museum. You know, they're coming here on their vacation so they can dig up dinosaurs, and they don't even know about the hot springs. But then there are people that come to the hot springs that don't know about the museum. So uh, it's, it's very important to, to bring more people here just because that's what our town, that's what our town needs. And, and this, is, this, is the, this is the selfie, a selfie generation or a selfie time period. You have people who literally show up and take pictures of anything that they're around surrounding. Uh, we've had people where it's, it, they walk around with a selfie stick in their hand because I'm so out of touch. I thought it was a nine iron. Why is the person walking around with a nine iron? But the two of the terms that we use on a regular basis here when it comes to people visiting is hands-on, shovel-ready. Get some dirt beneath your fingers and see what we're actually doing in the field. It's nice and pretty to see the articulated position material here and read our explanations and descriptions and interpretations of what they are, but get up there and see what we're doing. For every one hour you spend in the field doing the Indiana Jones thing of collecting the dinosaur bone, you have to spend six hours in the lab. That's an actual farm. So you want to come see what we're doing? Get your hands dirty by prepping or, or digging first, visiting the sites, see what we do. Get your hands dirty. And when it comes to that, people are picking up on an experience of something rather than just looking at it through the lens of either through that window or through their own camera. How do you, I mean, how do you explain going on a, uh, a wine tour of Europe without getting, you know, somewhat plastered? You have to, you have to drink some of the stuff. So if you're going to come out here and explain dinosaurs, get your hands dirty. And because they have to do that, that's the aspect of staying overnight. So when you want to ask about tourism, the experience has to be more than just a couple hours. So I'd like to add a couple of things to your question. Um, the Dinosaur Center has a significant impact for Thermopolis itself. We get about 40,000 visitors through our doors every year. Um, the majority of those come from May through September. Not all of them stay the night locally. However, we have about 850 participants in our programs for the summer, and about 90% of those stay in hotels locally. So they're shopping, they're buying fuel, they're eating at our restaurants. So we do have a significant impact um, for the Thermopolis community. I have it. <laughs> Strangers in the night. Oh. Um, back in the 1870s, when I was much younger, there were <laughs> dinosaurs taken out of Wyoming at Como Bluff in southern Wyoming. You indicated, uh, Jess, a bit ago, that a variety of specimens being taken from Howard's site. How does the combination of his ranch plus the six sites we have up on the hill compare with the uh, amount of materials that were removed and 
taken elsewhere from Como Bluff. And we have the same potential <coughs> as that. I, I wouldn't say we have the same potential, like the same amount of material, because what we have here is just like a small fraction of what has been taken out. I mean, it's like 1% compared to 99% of the specimens that have been removed. But there, there is a potential of finding more. There's, I don't think there'll ever be a potential of, of equaling the amount that's been removed from the state because it's still actively happening. But, uh, but we do have the potential of finding more material, yes. Yeah, I guess that also just to add to that, it's, it's interesting you mentioned about the 1870s, so that you have to go back and think about the time for the, the bone wars, these two famous American paleontologists, Cope and Marsh, and yeah, they, they were finding dinosaurs at breakneck speed in left, right, and center. Um, that's the interesting thing, again, going back to Hesperonithoides here, is that they were collecting so much material, and even then they didn't find anything like Hesperonithoides. Now, was it a case that they, because they were looking so quickly, they were passing all the small stuff? Maybe. But, you know, techniques have changed quite a bit as well, and, you know, over the last probably 30 plus years, people will be looking generally for smaller stuff as well. And so, you know, it really does highlight the, the significance of, Hes of Hesperonithoides as a discovery and the importance for for um, so as is, as is often the case with some like scientific discoveries, they can raise uh, additional questions after the initial outpouring of knowledge. Uh, what are you each most confused about now that uh, Lori has been discovered? What are new questions that have been raised because of the discovery? I think that's what, what Dean just said is, is why are there not more? Why are we not noticing more? Was it because of focusing on really big animals like Jimbo? But here's the thing, if you're looking for, if you're looking to prepare something big, you might notice the small things. So in the course of preparation of big things, uh, you'll notice details, you'll notice bite marks, scratches, stuff like that in the bones. So you start noticing the interaction of that animal in the, in the situation of how it got, died and was buried. So I think when it comes to uh, questions, it's why are there not more of them, and how can we fix that? You know, with, in the case of COVID March, were they collecting things and just bypassing the small stuff because everybody wants a big dinosaur in their their display hall? That's a very good reason. So that's called collection bias. Sorry, that's called collection bias. People are interested in something big to show off in their uh, in their display cases. They might bypass something small that's going to be crunchy and underneath their heels before they pay attention to it. So other questions to it is, what are the, some, the person who asked the question, uh, uh, well, it was a text message. What is the association of that plus true dantids in China from an earlier time, from a, 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 an older time period? How did true dantids come into North America? If so, what was the route? How did they come in? Did they follow the, uh, the, the Sunman Seaway system in? I'm not saying if they float in the little rafts or something, but they could have easily followed the awesome. water system. <laughs> they could have followed the water system in. They could have followed the, the, the expansion of a resource of new, of new environments and followed that resource, which is food, which is living conditions, <coughs> from colder to warmer, warmer to colder, et cetera. So again, so that's another question to ask. There's also small aspects of the skeleton that are not being looked at yet. Other people might pick up a ball and run with it. We have very small, thin bones inside the throat. They're called hyoids. These are these are like the, the, the thickness of a hair, and they're still visible if you look at that block underneath the microscope. That the hyoid bones. The hyoid bones associated with the dinosaur control vocalization. They control the, the, the size and expansion of the throat. You know, it's something like that. Somebody could maybe tell us whether that they could yodel or not. It's it's whether it's it's, it's the little things like that that somebody's going to take a next step forward. The information on the sheath on the claw has not been described yet. You know, is that something that's more geochemistry? You know, what are the, what are the conditions that preserve that? So, a lot of a lot of information can be expanded into from or expanded from that one uh, discovery. Can't do. So the proportions of the lower hind limbs to the upper hind limbs seems like this animal is built for speed. Any idea how fast this animal could be when it was in full-on hunting mode? That's something we haven't looked at. That's a, that's a good question. Yeah, we haven't really uh, thought about it. I 
I guess if you compare it to, say, Velociraptor or something like that, and maybe wants to scale that down a little bit, and work on new things. Uh, I think your analogy to a chicken is relatively yeah, good. Yeah, so. that yeah. makes sense, yeah. Uh, what I look at is the, it, it, it's, it's not a really long tail compared to the Velociraptor. What I pointed out to somebody today is that the Velociraptor has also long bony struts that support the tail all the way out, so the tail is not as maneuverable. So that means that the body was dedicated to forward motion without, with, was dedicated to speed, but not necessarily maneuverability. When I look at something like this with a shorter tail, without that, those bony rods, it didn't mean that the tail was more flexible, but with that plus the, the, the long legs and the arms, I'm suggesting more maneuverability. So maybe this thing was ducking in and out of foliage around a, an active water source, going after small animals that were going to that water source or living in the water source. Maybe it was going after aquatic invertebrates. Maybe it was, I mean, those, those claws, I mean, aside from the teeth, the business end of an animal is the mouthful of teeth, the serrated teeth. Those teeth are small compared to the size of the head. But look at the size of the claws. Those are meat cleavers on those fingers, and it still has that retained <coughs> raptoran killing claw. So I think whatever it ran into for a food source by that moving water, you know, was food. A juvenile of its own kind, babies of another dinosaur, toads, frogs, which we do have examples of. Some of the things we found at the dinosaur site, we have examples of a, a toad that was, a frog that was collected here at one of our sites. We have examples of little lizards. So, and then there's the small mammals that, are, that are, have been found in other formations, not yet here. To find some of the small stuff, you have to sieve a ton worth of material to find, because there's individual teeth. So that's another project somebody could work on because of expansion. But this, how does this thing live? What does it live off of? You know, start finding more stuff. Have you had any researchers indicate, um, those who aren't involved in the project currently, have you had any of them indicate that they would be interested in looking closer at some of these questions? I haven't uh, had anyone contact me. I don't know if anyone's contacted Bill or Dean. Um, not, not that I'm aware of. There's been a few comments uh, here and there on sort of social media across Twitter saying, oh, this would be cool to go and see this. But I, I strongly suspect over the next year or so, there'll be quite a few researchers come through here to take a look at the specimen. Because it'll be important, not only, not only is it good just to just take a look at the research that we provided and, and so on, but it's important for them to come and you know, make their own assessment as well, not take our stuff at face value, so it's good to, to assess all of it. And maybe, you know, maybe they can find something else as well that we've missed. It's, it's always possible. So yeah, I'd be interested to see what happens there. And, Potentially, then that might that might, that work may go into a bigger picture study of the phylogeny stuff again, looking at the, the family. So, yeah, I suspect there'll be a lot of people over the coming years come through here. And I'm sure if we were to ask uh, Jesse if there was a if there was a different technology, somebody wants to look at the same specimen we have with a different a different set of eyes, literally a different technological set of eyes. <coughs> Is there a different microbeam? Is there atomic force microscopy that can be done with this stuff? You're going to have to use that to identify the, the sheep on the claw. So when you talk about have other people contact and look at the specimen, some of, some of the criticisms have been on methodology of, a, of a, a phylogeny within this group. So they have a problem with perhaps how, what, what animals we associated with, what animals we kept out or added in. And that's gonna be one of the questions they have to have themselves. So they may look, develop their own methodology, but they still have to come back and look at the original source. The, the majority of what I did for master's thesis was a description, archeology span of the specimen description. Then it was relationships. So if somebody may come up and say, I'm, I'm, not, I'm completely 100% behind your description. I would like to see the specimen ourselves. And we're not going to say, no, it's mine and hide it under my bed in the box. It's going to be, you come here, see what we're doing, and if you want to do more study on it, do so. The, one, the wonderful thing about having the archaeopterists here at this museum is we've never denied anybody access to one of the most important specimens ever collected. We're not going to start that now. You want to come see something? You have a valid scientific research question to do. It's not just, I want to model your little dinosaur bones. No. They have, to, they have to have a valid research project. And you're not going to do any damage to it. It has to be, not, it has to be non-invasive you know, forms of, of looking. If the person says they want to do more prepping on the specimen, I'm going to uh, say no. So. Jessica, are you going to develop educational materials for like Wyoming schools and, and others based on this? As of right now, I'll be developing some educational materials
material for the museum uh, specifically first. And I, I have reached out to some schools, but nobody has like basically come, come to me and said, hey, we want you to, to, to write you know, this, uh, the aspect of, of this curriculum. Um, but I'm totally open to, to doing that if somebody wants to contact me, if any, any teacher or um, superintendent or anything like that of any school district in the state, I'd be more than happy to, to help out with that. <coughs> okay, so I'm gonna jump in here now and say as the moderator exercise a little discretion here, we've been at this for about an hour. Unless there's somebody that has some really pressing question they just have to ask, I'm going to say I think we'll adjourn here in just a few minutes. Excellent questions by everybody. I'm really impressed. And I want to thank you all for coming tonight, showing your interest and showing your support. And Jesse, thank you very much for your input. I appreciate that very much. Yes? I have a question for Andy. Um, what is the timeline for the new center? out on the highway. Fundraising, right? <laughs> Fundraising, yeah. Um, we're currently still um, in our capital campaign um, fundraising, so it, it'll be a few years before um, the center is built. Are you going to do anything temporary out there to yep. the peak interest to get people over here? No, not this time. So before we adjourn the formal part, and I'm sure all of us are going to be around here for a little while, so if anything pops into your head and you want to talk a little bit more about Rory, if you go down and look at the exhibit, you know, some of us can go down there and talk about it as well. Um, we are going to take a few minutes, bear with us, to make a little presentation. Research that's ever produced off his property. He literally has a shelf on his house of news reports, blurbs, uh, stuff in other languages because some of the material was shown off in Japan for Jimbo. And hopefully, this is uh, another addition to that shelf. This is a copy of the production paper that took 10 years to get from a master's thesis into a research paper. And we'd like to present a copy of this to you. members of the staff and people who have been out to the dig site that we get a hold of here to sign a copy of this. If I were to add everyone's name and signature to this who have ever been out to the site, there were literally dozens and dozens of people every year that have gone out to Howard's site that he's hosted and cooked breakfast for, for all of us, and allowed us to uh, drive them nuts on the property on a regular basis. This thing would be pitch black with, uh, with, with uh, signatures and well wishes. I'd like to hand you that. That's a copy of the paper. Thank That's you what you're welcome. I have one question. Yes. Didn't that kind of state of sort of multiple bones, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, 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 Howard's found multiple bones on his own. Usually at the very last week when we're trying to like dodge the snowflakes at the site, Howard will find something really large. It's like, okay, now we have to hurry up even faster to get stuff on the site. Uh, but yes, uh, Howard found some uh, stegosaur bones that were at the site that we made for a, uh, a volunteer who's no longer with us, uh, Jackie, uh, who passed away uh, and had cancer. cancer. But uh, we, we actually have a little memorial dedicated to the site, so Jackie's still up there uh, for the rest of us. So, but uh, uh, Jessica also has something she'd like to present you. So we went ahead and had this uh, painted up for you. So we had an artist that I know paint this, and this is of you and Helen with Lori. <laughs>
posts as well as you know, uh, uh, res uh, resource impacts on your property for some time. Uh, we're a major source of erosion for Howard's property. <laughs> But the largest dinosaur in Wyoming came off this hillside. The smallest dinosaurs come off this hillside. And we built many, many more. We've got to get down to the Sundance. <laughs> got to get a lot more of some stuff out there. Drive safely going home, okay? <laughs> All right, Facebook Live crowd, thanks for joining us. If we didn't get to your question, we'll be able to answer them next time for you. I'll answer them next week on Fossil Friday, so just stay tuned. But thank you all for joining us. Keep it fossiliferous, folks. 